Hi, and thank you for watching. Welcome to the Airbrush Online School. My name is Marissa, and in this webinar, I'm going to talk about some important techniques that every Airbrush artist should know. Shielding and masking are quite important techniques, whether you're doing fine art or custom painting. I think it's great if you know how it works. So let me show you a few ways of how to mask and shield for your airbrush. Masking and shielding can be quite an important technique for airbrushers, and I would like to show you several ways of doing that. They come in many forms, such as liquid mask, a solid masking tape, fine line tape, and shields or a piece of paper. They all mask. The only difference is that this one sticks, this one sticks temporarily until you peel it off, and this one you hold in your hand. Tape can be used to keep clean edges or to shield parts that need to be really straight. Now, there's different liquid masking pens or liquid masks that you can apply with a brush, and they are pretty great for reflections and highlights or effects such as snow tops on a mountain. Um, they are different, however, and the difference is usually in the substance. One is more sticky, one is thicker. The best one I find so far is this one. Uh, it's a masking fluid from Holbein and it comes in the shape of a ballpoint. You just need to squeeze this rubber part a little bit, shake it of course, and then squeeze and then you can make the finest lines, dots, etc. And it's almost dry when you look at it. The other ones are a little thicker and they need a longer dryer, drying time. Uh, and this one, the Molotov, sometimes leaves a bit more sticky glue to the painting. So the important thing is that you never leave them on too long, not even this one. The sooner you can remove it from your painting, the better. But they give incredible effects. I will show you a little bit um, later with the paint. Also, this one is pretty cool and it's not sticky, but it takes a long time to dry because this is the most fluid one and it can also be used in a little dish with, for example, an old toothbrush or a brush you dip it and then you use it for spattering. It can be cool for snow or sand, anything with little reflections in it or white. Um, you need to shake it really good and then let it sit for two minutes so it gets a little thicker and then the needle that you can find under here make sure that you can applicate it very, very, very fine. I need to shake it a little bit longer, but I can already show you how fine you can work with it if the paint is a little thicker. It's too runny right now, but oh, there we go. I feel the control. And with this, you can make also really cool stuff. So this is fluid and you can use them most of the time for reflections or effects. Now the one that comes solid, which is the the application film or masking film. Some also call it frisket, but that's actually a brand name. There is low tech and high tech, and this one is pretty low tech. That means it's not so sticky. And a great tip that I had from an old illustrator from the 70s is that if it's too sticky, you can use some cotton or jeans, so not, not too fibery, not fleece or something, to make it stick less, and then it doesn't damage the surface of your painting. So that's a great tip that we can all still use. Another tip that I need to give you about this is that you need a very sharp blade, preferably a new one, so that you don't have to push too hard when you apply it directly to your painting. Now let me just cut a piece and stick it to the board because there's another thing you need to know about this. This is a small piece, but when the pieces are larger, you apply them like that and you go with the film. You can also take something for that something straight so that there's no air bubbles. When there's still some air bubbles, you go to the center and you push them out with a flat hand or a piece of carton so that there are no air bubbles and you can cut safely without any um, disshaped forms. Now, when you have a sketch underneath, you can simply cut the shape out that you want to mask or protect. And when you take this off, it's easy that you make a little incision here on the side and that helps you to peel it up properly and you can go around and there is your protected shape. There's also the fine line tape. This can be great if you need really graphical things. And you can bend it around with your thumb and you just push and pull a little bit and you can make great shapes. This cannot be done with normal tape. 
you see it's a little bit more elastic, it stretches, and you can make cool curves and stuff like that. It's also easy to peel, it doesn't damage your work, they come in different sizes and also different texts. And then there's of course the normal tape, I usually take this clean edge tape, the name already says it, it gives a clean edge. And why do I use it? Usually for my passepartout, which is the white and clean border that you can find around my paintings, because they create also reference points for me that I can always find my edges and my borders so that I can measure my proportions. It's also great if you need to stick something to your painting and you don't want to damage the surface of the painting. Um, this, you see, is low-tech, so it doesn't take off anything of your paint. Of course, tape it will pick up because that's not stuck, but paint should be stuck to the board. And therefore, this is pretty safe and cool to use on your work to hang pieces of reference or anything else that you like to to use on your painting. A loose shield can also be used to protect things from unwanted paint and then you get these kind of things. We call them freehand shields. They come in various sizes and shapes. They're also pretty cool shields. We don't call them freehand shields, but then they are templates. And templates can be templates of skulls or roses that already look pretty nice and they're already cut for you. And all you need to do is spray through them with the preferred color and then you'll have your little mini painting and you can refine them. These however are freehand templates and we use them to protect areas from paint. You can create different um, effects with it so if you keep them flat to the surface you create sharp edges and if you increase the distance the edge gets softer and softer and you can create intermediate edges. You can also use a piece of felt for that, which is a little thicker. And I love to use the side of my hand because that gives the perfect intermediate edge. You just get a super dirty hand, but for that we have soap. Now, I'll just show you how these liquid masks work because that is pretty cool to show. Make sure that you never leave the liquid mask on longer than an hour or two, because then it tends to get sticky and gooey. And I will also show you the frisket, how nice and clean that is. Make sure that things are always pressed down, like tape. This is pressed down because we flatten it with the side of the hand. But this here can be uh, sometimes a little bit looser and sharper. So make sure that you also press the tape down and then you get the same sharp edge everywhere. Same for the clean. This will give you a nice contour if you have your painting protected. I'll just show you how clean it peels off. You see there's no paint going underneath. That's why it's called clean edge. It's soft. It doesn't damage. And the same for this. It's really nice and clean and round. <laughs> then this here, it's safe not to do it with your nails because you might scratch your artwork. In this case, there's nothing to scratch. But anyway, I'll do it right. Just pick it up with the flat side, oh, this side of your um, tip of the knife and then you carefully peel it loose. And this here you can do it with clean fingers, a soft rubber eraser um, or the, uh, it's called Mask Away from Frisk. It's a special tool for these kind of gooey stuff. It also takes stickers from your window, but it's perfect. It doesn't leave any residue and it makes almost no scratches unless the surface is super smooth. You need to be always careful when you remove a liquid mask, for example, a metal or synthetic paper, they have less um, grip. And then when you touch it, you might scratch and damage the surface. So there I would use my fingers to prevent scratching. One of my favorite ways to create texture is to do it freehand because you have so much control and you can decide if it's going to be dark or soft, hard and sharp, light, etc. When you spray through shields to create te texture, you cannot always see that. And that's why I love to do it freehand. I'm going to show you two of my favorites. The first one is to just keep the paint and air on and you play with the distance and the amount of paint that you give, but also the speed. If you are a little bit further away, your speed is a bit slower, and when you go closer, you increase the speed. Let's go. First we find the paint, and then we slowly move up and down. If you increase the speed, you create more texture.
Don't put your cup too full with paint because it can spill when you do this. I'm going to go a little bit closer to the board and I will give less paint and I increase the speed. This will create sharper textures. Don't put them too close together because then you will become, then you will get a dark blob. So leave some space. You can see this can function as skin textures, hair, moss, sand. You just need to see the shape around it and of course the shadow and the light. You can blend if you want the textures to be a little bit softer and more together. So this is a really fun and cool way to create fast and effective textures. You can also do a little bit slower and with some more variation of distance and jumping um, if you need a super detailed cheek or nose for example um, then you just use your left hand as a support you find the paint in a dark area so that's always safe and from there you can take the paint and all I do is keep the paint on and jump from spot to spot increase the speed a little bit so they become more blurry and if you want them sharp, you go a little softer and slower. It's also perfect to do the texture for reptiles or elephants, anything with scales, amphibians. Actually, it looks like a frog to me. Um, so remember that speed and distance are a big um, friend to decide how soft or how sharp your texture is going to look. The other one is splattering and this can be used for the beard for example for stopples or for someone with almost no hair so practically bald but you can always see some roots and dots on the head. Um, you can use them for sand or a nice dust uh, in, the, in the sky, stardust. So I'm going to decrease the pressure, almost put it on zero. Let's use this one. So when there's almost no air coming out, you try the paint to so just give air and paint at the same time. You can see that the dust now is still quite solid. So I want them to disperse more, give less pressure and the dots become bigger. So the less pressure, the bigger the dots. And when they are still wet, you can squeeze them even with your finger. You see how much I am in control of the shape? I can really decide where to put them. And when they are wet, you can also squash them for a super cool effect. Now, if you um, do this with white, for example, they look like stars. If you do it with brown and a mix of black and white on top of a nice base, you can turn it into sand. You can think of many ways to use this, even as skin texture. You can combine this with that and create some kind of a layer for the skin. Um, also for fruits and stones, rocks, anything natural this technique can be used. You can also do it with um, giving some scraping to the trigger and then press with air. But you see it's uncontrolled and I have no idea what's coming out. So this is always stable. If you need this effect, scrape the needle and then give some air. It's just a bit less controllable, it's more organic, but sometimes you need that effect. You can even do it by squeezing the hose, which is basically the same as using the regulator. But some people don't have that, so they squeeze the hose and then open it slowly until they have the preferred size of the splatter. Always remember that there is still some wet paint on the needle, so when you start painting, just use some paper or your hand to take off the dirt. Another great way to create organic textures is to use something with holes in it. This can vary from any piece of fabric that you find on the market with holes in it or a piece of paper that you can poke some uh, gaps and holes in it. But you can also buy them, for example, this one from R2 is designed by Gerald Mendez and you can create super cool organic textures with it. You can also play with the distance for soft texture or sharp texture and you can even move them while you're spraying. This requires a little bit of um, you know, practice, but when, when you can do it, it's pretty cool. I'm gonna show you how to work with them and what different effects you can give. 
If you press it down flat, I use my thumb and my finger to regulate the size. Let's put some air. Press them flat for a sharp effect. And increase the distance for a softer effect. Now I'm going to move the stencil a little bit while I spray. You see what this gives? A completely different texture from the other two, but also totally cool. It looks very similar to what I've done here, but with a stencil. You can combine every kind of texture that you can create with or without stencil. And you can also overlap them with other textures, of course, to create more organic patterns. This is a filter. And also that is pretty awesome. So just go and find something with holes in it, um, practice your freehand texturing uh, techniques and then you will be sure that you can give anything the desired texture that you want. And now for some great tools that can help us to create textures and highlights, erasers and scrapers. Um, you cannot use them on every surface. For example, this is a clay board and it can handle blades and erasers very well. But if you work on canvas or on cars, you cannot always scrape. You can erase, however. Now let's see what we can do with different erasers and different tools. All you need is thin layers of paint because else you create a super hard and sharp texture and this often gives you too much uh, exaggeration, too high contrast in the lights and in the darks. So the best way to do it is to build up in very thin layers until you reach your preferred darkness. Now this is just a very little and quick sample that I've done once to test some, some paints on, the, on a little piece of clayboard. So it's really nothing and it's great for trying out stuff. So let's just give some thin layers of paint and then we'll use various tools to take out some highlights and textures. It's also important that the paint is dry enough to do it because when you rush, like I said, rushing is never good, but when you rush the paint can also still be wet and it can cause really horrible things like holes in your painting. So I think I have enough paint for now and we can start with an eraser uh, stick. This is an eraser stick and it's quite an aggressive one. It's pretty cool that it's flattened on two sides and if you want them even sharper you can use a piece of sandpaper. This is rough and this is fine. It's a Faber-Castell sandpaper but you can use any sandpaper. Uh, for the erasers I like to use the rougher ones. Hold them flat on the table. This one you can even hold in your hand. And you can scuff and sharpen them from two sides. This will give you a super cool and fine tip to scrape out some lighter looks in the hair. There we go. Don't remove the dust with your fingers and blowing them away with your mouth is also not a good idea because you can spit um, and that can also create some nice stains. But use a dust brush. It doesn't scratch and it takes off all the dust. And here you can really work those hairs up in layers and create nice textures or highlights. Now, if you want them sharper, you can go on top with blades or um, how you call them, fiberglass pens. Because you also first want to create softness underneath and then sharpness on top. So never the other way around. Now that I have my soft base, I can start with scraper tools such as these. They're pretty cool and they're all doing something different. This is a four millimeter um, uh, glass fiber pen and this is a two mil. Then this is a scratch tool. They come also with round blades in one pen package. So they come with this one and a round one. It scratches and it can't really damage the surface. And this is just a normal blade. You can take any sharp blade. 
the danger with this is that people often scratch and damage through the surface because they use it wrong. How can you use this wrong when you hold it up too straight and when you press too hard? Just hold it flat and let it slide. So don't scratch, just scrape it off, scrape it off. Now, let's see how that works. The scraping is done with the side of the blade and if you want them really fine and thin, you can even turn it backwards and do it with the back side of the blade. Because all we need is something sharp enough to take off some paint. You don't want to cut in your painting, you just want to scrape it off. And now I've created a sharper and finer texture on top, a brighter light. You can also do it with these tools. They are sometimes easier to hold for people. And I need to give a bit more pressure because it's used a little longer than the new blade, so it is more blunt. But also here we can create sharp and bright textures. Always give back some paint when you do that because this is unnatural looking. And the idea is that you layer these techniques. Of course we cannot scrape on cars with those blades, but for that, for example, we have the fiber pens. If you have this in your fingers, it can itch and sting you quite hard, so I always remove it with a piece of tape. So let me take some tape, then I can pick it up as soon as I've got some fibers on the painting. Also, for your animals or breathing it is quite dangerous, so always make sure you got some tape. Now let's see, all you need to do here is give a light pressure and then repeat your movement. And the flatter your tip is, the sharper the hairs will be. This is not that flat anymore, so it creates a softer and wider texture, but you can sharpen them on the sandpaper straight. I'm not going to do that here because I will have lots of fibers. You need to do that above the garbage can. Pick up the fibers and then they can go nowhere but in your tape. So this is really the safest way to remove the dirt from the fiber, you see. And then there's also the formula, and people often think, oh, that's too big for the fine hairs, but nothing uh, uh, less far from the truth, because this here is often sharper than the small one, as we are using only the side of it. Now let's see here, the same, you repeat the movement, and you can see it's giving the same sharpness as the other one, but it's double the size. It's also pretty cool to combine them. So this combined with the knives or the erasers, they all have their specialties. Nothing does what the other one does. So the combination is often the most precious uh, or precious one. Also the most fun way because you have some, some uh, variation in it. And then of course there are also the eraser pens and pencils. These here are quite soft. This is a Tombow eraser pen. It's a flat one, there's also a round one. This is the most common one. It's the Faber with a hard side and a soft side. So it's for ink and pencil. But the pencil also removes our ink if you work in thin layers. And this is a cool one from Faber. It's just an eraser stick but it, it allows you to rub and divide the pressure pretty good so you don't make so much stains and you can carefully lighten up areas that needs to be slightly lighter but not so much texture. Another stuff that we have, another cool thing, is the electric eraser. Now, they are like little mini drills, so they are quite aggressive. And if you've never used it before, I would say practice it for a few minutes so you get the feeling with it. Some people hold them like this, some people hold them uh, like this or like this. You can hold them as you feel comfortable. I do it like this, like a pen. And uh, you can angle them for a sharp line or you can put it up more straight for some little dots. Now let's angle it because I want to have lines. And you can also use your hand to stabilize the eraser. We got the eraser also in another form. This is the Tihu, which is a smaller one. The tip is a little short right now, so 
it's too short to erase, but it's very fine and it's great for tiny, tiny highlights in textures, for example, or in eyes to bring them back. And another thing that we have are the normal erasers, of course. This is a called a soap or a cheese eraser because of the shape and they're round, so they don't make any uh, stripes when you erase. They take it off gradually, quite nice in, an, in a transition. And these do the same thing. They're quite flexible, they're soft and yet strong, so they can take off quite some paint without making damage. And for the hairs, they're not really suitable, but they're cool if you want to make softer highlights. And this one is the most standard one. It's the same as this. You need to flatten it a little bit on the sandpaper and then you can also pull out those locks of hair. So they are more for the base of the hair, not so much for the refinement of the hair. And another cool thing that we have when, when it comes to taking off paint and creating texture is sandpaper. This is a sand pad, so it's a, like a little soft pet you can see that the soft side is to remove the dust and this here is to take off the paint and it can help me with corrections or to soften things or to create skin textures just twist and take off the paint to create textures or to remove areas that are unwanted remove the dust with the other side and there we go we can do more effective things with erasers and that is with a piece of paper and of course a thin layer of paint. So let's apply a, a thin layer of paint first again. You can also see that blending the hairs together gives a more natural effect. And then if you would like to make details, now it's in there, but you can do it anywhere, of course. I'm just going to show you a technique. You can take a simple piece of paper. This is just note paper from a note block and some scissors if you want to change the, the shape of the paper. You can cut it into little curves, for example. Then you take an eraser pencil. Let's take the most common one because I think everyone has this and um, if you need super sharp and white aggressive textures take the white side if you need very soft and subtle textures yet sharp take the pink side I'm gonna go for the white one because it's easier to show on the camera first I'm going to take my knife and chop off a little piece of this tip so I make it flat so, so now one side is flat and this already gives me sharp edges. I can show you just with, with this. You see? It's pretty soft and, uh, or pretty sharp and bright. But if you want this more precise, you can take a piece of paper and erase with the flat side up against the edge of the paper. Just keep rubbing until it's wide enough. And if you remove that, you have an incredible sharp and precise highlight. Now you can imagine any shape that you need um, and you cut it and you erase against it. There we go. Let's close this webinar with something about position because everyone is always asking me, how do you hold your airbrush? Well, for me, it's very important that it's ergonomic so I don't have any angles with my wrist and I have to be able to paint for 20 hours a day if it's needed because I work with deadlines and I have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm also teaching long days and sometimes you need to take over other airbrushes. So I always find the most comfortable and ergonomic way for me to hold that airbrush. First of all, I have this um, grip filter that allows me to grab it without punching or pinching into my airbrush. And the airbrush is also resting on my thumb, on the fulcrum. So the other fingers are just closing the airbrush so it doesn't fall out of my hand. And you can see that this finger is completely um, horizontal onto the body. It's not hooking over, it's not on top. So I have everything straight without any angles and it's super ergonomic. I can paint all the day. Also very important when I do details, I close these fingers a little bit so the grip filter comes into the palm of my hand. This doesn't move, it's just closing into the palm of my hand 
and my index finger goes really down to the bottom of the trigger, pulling it only with the side of this uh, fingertip. That means that I have the full control over the tiniest amount of paint and that allows me to do the miniatures that I often do. Um, if I would hook it behind or put it on top, I would give much more paint at the same time and I don't have any control to do those super, super small details. So for me, this really works. And um, if I don't do details, because it's not um, advised to do that all the day, it will give you cramp after a few hours eventually. So sometimes you need to give some rest to your, to your hand. And when I blend, for example, I just release the other finger. So this is for detail and this is not for detail. So when I can stretch my hand, I have a relaxation. And when I squeeze it a little bit, I can do my details. Now, there's also some information about lines and shading that is bothering me uh, because some people make shadings full of stains and they do lines with dots and stains as well. So what is the trick there? I'm going to explain that to you. So for shading, you need a proper angle. You cannot just go horizontal on your surface because that will create a line. So now you also have the answer for lines. For lines, you go with the surface. Yeah, you go with the surface and you can create your lines. And if you want them thicker, you just build up more paint. You don't give more paint, you just create more layers. So your line gets thicker and softer and wider, whatever you want. Now, if you do shading, you just angle the airbrush a little bit and you increase the distance. The distance is about four fingers to maximum 15 centimeter for this airbrush, because if you do it more, if you take a bigger distance with this specific airbrush, you get splatters because the distance is simply too far for the pressure that I'm using and they will land as little drops. So sometimes people are asking me, why do I get all these splatters when I do these smooth transitions and they're not making stains? But that is just because the crown cap combination and the distance of the micron gives you that splattery um, transition. So that's an important note. If you have a bigger airbrush, you can take also a bit bigger distance. Take off the crown cap because that creates splatters as well if you create bigger distance. Now, let's see the angle. You see, I just angle it and where I aim, this is where the paint will land. So if I don't want paint here, I aim where I want to have the paint. I can do the same thing from there and I can do the same thing from there. Now, if I, let's say, have a little shape here, the shape has a size, right? So the size of this is about 10 centimeter. If I want to shade this shape, I need 10 centimeters of distance. So that means that the distance is equal to the size of the shape. Not only the distance up, but also the distance from the side. Because if I would only hang up, I can only create a dot or a line because I don't have the angle. I also need an angle and the angle is created by going a little bit to the side of the shape. The side can be down, to the left, above, or to the right. So I have 10 centimeters here, and I have a little bit less, or even 10 centimeters, from the side. Now from here, I can simply angle my airbrush and shade the circle without any problems. I simply adjust the direction of the head. Even in the middle, you see where I am? To color the middle, I am almost 10 centimeters away from the side. And also here. When I'm shading, I'm also using my full arm, not only the wrist. If you use the wrist, that's more for smaller things because the wrist cannot move as freely as your whole arm. So for bigger areas, I shade with the full arm and for smaller areas, I do it more out of the wrist. And of course, you also give less paint. You see, now it's my wrist that is moving and not my full arm. If you want it darker, you simply build it up with more layers. So you don't give more paint because then this happens. It's ugly and it won't dry and you cannot do anything with that. You just build up more layers. It also allows you to clean uh, erase in it to uh, add extra textures on it because you have a lot of space to do things with it that you want but if you do that you have no space you just get frustration and you want to correct it but it's almost impossible um, so the trick is to build it up in layers whether you are erasing or painting it's always in layers even with erasing don't dig in it just go and go and go until you see the light appearing or the texture that you prefer 
Of course, when you do detail works, you need to decrease the distance and also the amount of paint because details are always small, even if you work on a big scale size painting. Um, and it's super important that the tip of your needle is clean. Now, for this, I can give you a few tips. First of all, you can add, for example, this is an acrylic paint, so you can add some retarder. I find this one specifically good. Um, it's the Schmincke Aero Retarder. Um, or you can add some flow aid of any kind of brand. Flow aid means it aids you to give a better flow. It also reduces, uh, reduces the tip dry. And also the medium uh, reducer or colorless are often named by brands such as Holbein or Createx. And they also help to reduce the tip dry. Um, but they also change the property of the color. They can become more transparent or they get thinner. And with the retarder, it doesn't really... Um, change the property of the color. It just gives you a retarded drying time. That means the, the paint dries less fast. So it, it's slower before it gets tip dry. Now, if there's some tip dry, you can remove it with a little Q-tip and not with a dry one because then you have lots of fluff and it gets stuck in the needle and in the nozzle and that's gonna give you huge problems. So don't do that. But when do you have tip dry? Well, when it splatters, when your line is becoming um, like uneven, like paint, no paint, skipping. Um, or when you hear a little buzz, like feed, then there's something in the nozzle. And that's caused by tip dry, dried up little pieces of paint. Now, remove the tip dry preventively so that you don't hear that buzzing peep in the nozzle. Uh, that's always best. And um, I simply do that with this and a bit of cleaner. Usually I have a cup with some cleaner that I can just dip it in, but this will work too. Not enough, so I, I wetten it a bit with some water. Even water is good. And then you put it on the needle. If you have a crown cap, you remove the crown cap. And it takes off all the dirty paint. You can even do it from the sides. Now this needle here is a special needle. It's the K33 needle. It doesn't clog up the paint as much as a standard needle. So you barely see me cleaning and sometimes just the sides of my fingers is enough. There's also a nice habit with airbrushers, especially when you're a bit more seasoned and you know what you're doing. Don't do this as a beginner. And that is picking the needle. You need to be super careful. If it's just water-based paint, you'll have more tip dry than if you're working with solvent-based paint or you know lacquers. Uh, they give much less tip dry, but uh, it's also easier to pick that with the size of your needle because it's less sticky. I don't recommend it if you're just starting out because you will have no feeling for that needle and you, you'll bend the tip. You can also use a wet brush, just a bristle brush, dip it in the cleaner and then just polish the needle. As long as the material that you're using to clean with is softer than the needle, you cannot harm it. Nails can be harder and sharper and more aggressive, so that is a little bit more dangerous. But for fine details and clean lines, you need a clean tip. Always give some air to make sure that there's no cleaner or dust or dirt along the, the headset. And then you can spray a little bit on a white paper just to test what's coming out. And if you're happy with it, you can start doing your details. Now for details, I would also recommend thinning a little bit more water-based paint with water um, and otherwise with solvents. I'm just going to add a little bit more water to this. And the more water, the more control. You cannot overthin your paint. Uh, well, you can overthin your paint, but don't dilute it too much with water because then the pigments fall apart. So for details, you go very close. You have thin paint. You can use your left hand to support your right hand. So you are, you are stable. You move and you don't wait for the paint to come out, but you move a little bit and then you wiggle the trigger. Go very close. And you can see I'm painting super small tiny details. Distance, thin paint and stabilize your hand. I hope you enjoyed this webinar and uh, remember that practice makes perfect. Perfection is hard to reach in the art world but at least we have a lot of fun trying to reach it. See you in the next.